Well, two Drudge Report headlines got my attention. One of them is flying cars are almost here, and the other one was sex robots can be programmed to kill. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your right angle, not on that subject at all, because, frankly, when I thought about the idea of sex robots using flying cars to come and kill everybody, I was pretty nervous, as you can only imagine. It's going to hide under my desk. <laughs> and and as that future gets closer and closer and closer, I have no doubt we'll become more and more and more worried about it. But what I'd like to talk about is is something that's that's highlighted by Hurricane Irma, but it's not about Hurricane Irma at all, really. I have to preface this very careful, very carefully. There have been numbers of people have been killed, millions of people have lost uh, enormous amounts of property, including my sister, for what it's worth. Oh. Uh, and uh, and and there's going to be misery for lack of air conditioning and, and all the rest. And and these people have my deepest sympathy. I lived in Miami for 25 years, so I want to be crystal clear that I am not that I'm not unconscious of their suffering and their pain. But I recall Hurricane Andrew hitting South Florida and Hurricane Andrew scoured South Florida. You could not find out where you were. In South Miami or Homestead or on Key Biscayne where I grew up, you couldn't find anything because the bushes, the trees, the street signs were gone. They were absolutely gone. Wow. And Hearing the reports of Hurricane Irma, I thought that this was Andrew times three, and it's going to go right up I-95, and it's going to do that to the entire state of Florida. And that didn't happen. Nothing close to that happened. And when I saw the first footage of the post-hurricane video, I said there are trees still standing, and there are still bushes there. It doesn't seem to be as bad as I, as I was afraid it would be. And so I don't want to talk about Hurricane Irma. I want to talk about the idea that we that we never seem to get what we are the most afraid of. Scotty, you remember your, what you, you've been selling computers for a while now. Um, we can all remember back in the late 90s, the whole idea of Y2K, that once, once the clock ticks over to zeros, airplanes are going to fall from the sky, traffic lights are going to be green on both sides, bank machines are going to be spitting out $20 bills. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff was going to happen. Huge amounts of money were spent, but certainly not enough to make it to make up for the fact that nothing happened, nothing. And, and we seem to be able to either get very lucky very often, or there's a part of the human imagination, and this is the part I'm interested in, that is built to amp up dangers to levels that danger cannot actually reach. Danger is not up to the task. Uh, I'm afraid, <laughs> again, right. with the qualifier of all the suffering yeah. and the deaths and so on, but yes. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that there's a combination of things going here. A lot of this, um, as we've talked about in previous episodes of Right Angle this week, and I'm sure that you watch each episode uh, religiously multiple times a week, um, is really a product of our media-driven um, you know, world. I mean, not only do we, you know, when I was a kid growing up, when I was a kid, we had news once a day, and there were three minutes of the weather, and that was it. Like, if if something, you know, terribly catastrophic happened, they might break into a soap opera, but probably not because a lot of people would be upset. So, you know, you waited to the end of the day and then you found out, oh, by the way, there's a hurricane coming or whatever. We're not quite sure where it's going to go or what happened after it got there. Um, but now because we have cameras everywhere and the ubiquity of the handheld camera um, is having a huge effect because they can, you know, literally journalists are tweeting to people and saying, hey, can I use that video on tonight's CBS Evening News? You know, so we've got a, a, we just got huge amounts of content and a legitimate interest on the part of the Weather Service and government officials to get people out this of harm's way. And I'm sure they're all thinking better to err on the side of caution than Absolutely. otherwise. And, and frankly, I find myself looking at this. I saw a video today of a car very much like yours, Bill, that was up to the, the bottom of the windows in water. And I and it's a gorgeous and I I'm not sure but it may have been a Camaro and I'm looking at it and going, who who possibly leaves their Camaro in the path of a storm that took six days to get there? I mean, how could it possibly <laughs> still be there? You know, it's like you're waiting for an insurance claim. So you know, I I do think that there is an over hyping going on. I think to a certain extent that could be healthy because it could save people's lives. I'm not tremendously disappointed that that things aren't worse than they are. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, my relatives and loved ones in the area 
survive that thing. But I think that it is just a product of sensational media that says we've got to sell this. We've got to sell it hard. We've got to get people to watch our coverage of this thing. And it goes back to my old professor in Jern school, John Nichols, who said news is coups, earthquakes and three legged chickens. And that's what you've got to push. And, uh, you know, I guess there are worse things that could happen, Bill. There are worse things that could happen than people think that they're going to have a scouring Andrew and they only wind up with a highly disruptive and terrible Irma. The reason I'm interested in this, guys, and, and Steve, this question's for you, is because it's not because of natural disasters. I, it's very, I, I have no intention of criticizing either the media or the National Weather Service or anybody for making the storm into what it is and was, which is a killer storm, absolutely gigantic, 650 miles across, 180 mile an hour winds. Uh, it, it's a brute. And I'm not for a second saying that they, that they were incorrect to, to advise us of the, of the threat oh, yeah. there. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I am saying is, they showed us pictures of uh, downtown Miami where one of these cranes had partially collapsed. And I thought, oh, that looks bad. And then I realized, but all the windows in the buildings around it were still there. I didn't think the windows were going to be there. I didn't think any of this was going to be there. So my question, Steve, is this. If this is what happens during natural disasters, if this, if this turning up the volume on the, on the intensity of things is happening in front of our eyes after something like this is over, then how much of this is in our life on a daily basis? How much of everything that we take mm. in now is going through that same filter? That's the entire reason I'm doing this show. I'm interested in finding out how much of this is human nature and and how pervasive is it? Well, that's a really good question. Let me, let me answer this in two parts. When you compare the destruction uh, between now and then and even, even further back, the difference is money and technology. We are so wealthy. Uh, you know, yes, Miami was, was wiped out by, by Andrew, but when they rebuilt that city into one of the great cities in the world, they spent a lot of money and they got it right. They've got windows that hold up. They've got buildings that hold up. The, the stuff is just much sturdier, much stronger, much more prepared than it was 25 years ago. And if you go back, uh, uh, what was it, 117 years ago to the, the big one that hit Galveston, that killed, what, 12,000 people? In, in in the course of a of a few days, twelve thousand people. That's more than we lost on nine eleven in the Iraq War and Afghanistan combined. And our Do, population was much much smaller than it is now. Exactly. We had maybe a hundred million people back then. Not even a, a third of the number of Americans we have today. So, just the, the benefits that that accrue to a wealthy society. Compare what happened to uh, to 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 Key West, which will be rebuilt in, in a couple of years, and what happened to Cuba, which still hasn't recovered from the 1950s, and, uh, and communism, it's, it's, it's just a world of difference. We are, uh, we're just a, a blessed nation in so many ways. Uh, the other part of it, sort of that, that, that reptile brain of ours that gets so angry and upset and lashing out at everything. You know, uh, when I was growing up, my mom and I lived with, uh, with her folks quite often, and we got both newspapers back in the, when there was a morning paper and an evening paper. And the morning paper, the Globe Democrat, was generally conservative. My grandfather would read that over breakfast. And in the evening, he'd come home and have a martini and read the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which was just as left-wing as you can get, and, and it still is. The Globe is gone. The, the Post is still around. And I'd ask him, why do you read the Post when all it does is make you mad and, and have a second martini? And boy, did I learn a lot from that man. Uh, and, 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 he, and he told me, you got to keep an eye on what the enemy is up to. And he, he, he might get so angry that uh, the next day maybe he would write a letter to the editor. But that would involve, you know, getting out a typewriter and, and typing things down manually and, you know, making the corrections with, uh, with, your, with your whiteout. And it was, a, it was a slow process that happened the next day. And by the time you were, you were finished with your letter, maybe you'd send it in, maybe you didn't, and then it would be up to the newspaper as to whether or not they'd actually publish it. So everything everything was a little slower, and your reptile brain had a chance to go, you know, maybe this isn't such a big deal after all. And and today, you see something on CNN, and you whip out your iPhone, and you pull up Twitter, and you directly communicate with Jake Tapper, why you nasty so-and-so, how could you? And that anger feeds on itself, and it builds on itself. We just, we lash out so much because it's, it's so easy. Maybe we need to, to slow it down a notch sometimes. At least on the weekends. 
Yeah, I mean, to say the least, um, this is a an interesting phenomenon because I, I, I think it is something that is something that we're taking in with the air. Uh, mm. I, I only know a little tiny bit about this, but as usual, that doesn't prevent me from giving you my opinion <laughs> oh, on it. Oh, thank God. <laughs> But, but I'm fairly sure it's called the upper the upper limit problem. And basically, the argument is this: our bodies are are built for for fight or flight. That we are that we are constructed in such we are cut we are. This is the same body that we had when humans were not just predators but prey also. And that and that the idea of somebody being nervous enough, awake enough, alert enough to be sitting up at night watching the mouth of the cave with the spear ready is in fact those are the people that survived and the ones that say, ah, what could possibly go wrong those people are not with us anymore what's interesting about that is this we live in a world where everything is so remarkably safe we've gone 17 16 17 years without a without a major air crash in this country and on a on a large uh, american carrier 17 years without so much as a single uh, plane crash that i am worried that this mechanism is tuning us all up to hit that fight or flight level reaction no matter what the stimulus is and even if it's a small Dang. stimulus it gets us there because that's what we're built for we're this is a survival mechanism for us so look maybe we just keep getting lucky but i remember when the ozone hole was going to destroy all life on earth i remember when global freezing was going to destroy all life on earth i remember when depletion of natural resources was going to kill everybody i remember when the population bomb was going to kill everybody and all my life i'd been surrounded by people who were saying that this is the end of everything and so you'd better get ready and i find myself strangely disappointed you know, this is like, you promised me quite a big show. I, I, I went to see Armageddon and I got, you know, my dinner with Andre and it's not fair. I want my money back. Eight um, years. That's our first my dinner with Andre gag. Well done. Thank you. Again, the, the, the last thing I want to do is sound callous. To the, this is a catastrophe for people whose, whose property was lost or damaged, and it's a, more than a catastrophe for people who were killed. They're as dead in this hurricane as they would be if, if a half a million or two million or eight million people had been killed. I mean, nothing but, uh, but sincere respect and, and sincere sympathy for all of those people. It's not about individuals. I am concerned about the mechanism, and I'm concerned about our perception of things. And it might do us a little bit of good to recognize that either this is a biological mechanism that keeps happening or there's a god that loves drunks idiots in the united states of america or we just keep getting lucky in any event this one wasn't as bad as many of us thought it would be and regardless of the cause i think that's something despite the damage that we can all be extremely thankful and grateful for and hopefully it will motivate us in the right direction in the future. By the way, uh, uh, we'd mentioned this in the other right angles, um, the scenes from Houston of people helping each other, and I'm sure they're, they're gonna be similar scenes in, in Florida, remind us that there is more to life than politics, that people are better than they seem. As Scott said, people are better than they look on TV. He's absolutely right. This is all part of the phenomenon of showing us the dramatic, when in point of fact, it's the undramatic things that are the things that are the most precious and the most interesting and the things that make life worth living. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next week on Right Angle.